Hi everyone, uh, uh, today's video is going to be about the kind system in Haskell. So, so this was a, re a request, I, I think it originally came in through Twitter, about, you know, can we have sort of an introduction to how kinds work in Haskell? So that's what today, uh, today's uh, video is going to be. Um, I think it's going to be the first part of a two-part series where today I talk about sort of Haskell 98 kinds, kinds as they've existed in Haskell from the beginning, and then next week talk about how we can use more modern techniques to do even more powerful things in Haskell's kind system. Um, so this is going to sort of start from fairly um, uh, modest beginnings, but grow into something quite interesting even, even today. Uh, so it, it all starts the idea of of kinds. Well, actually, let's not let's not even start with kinds. Let's start with types. Something that we know uh, a little bit better. So let's. Uh, I'm going to import Prelude, hiding some basic things because I want to define not here. Um, so if I write not true equals false and not false equals true, that's that's a thing. Um, but if I think about the type of not, not isn't a bool. Right? I can't, down in GHCI here, I can't write if not then one else two. I'm going to get an error saying couldn't match expected type bool with actual type bool arrow bool. Right? And we're saying that between the if and the then, we're expecting something of type bool, but we're getting something actually of type bool arrow bool. And when we say that um, the, the reason not doesn't have this type is because we need to supply a bool to not in order to get a bool back. That's really what this type means. Um, is that we supply a bool to get a bool back. Um, and, and of course, we're, we're sort of used to this idea with normal types, right? If we have a function, then that means that we have to supply something in order to get something else out, maybe multiple somethings. Um, the same thing works one level up, we could say, um, when we talk about types. Um, so uh, here's an example. If we have a list type, which I'm going to sort of write out longhand uh, like this instead of using the built-in one because the syntax for the built-in one can be a little bit confusing. So we're just going to use this list type here. Um, so if I have this, that's good so far. Um, now I think, well, what is list, right? Normally I could say something like, you know, x is of type int, x equals 5, and that's good. But can I write y equals, y is type list, y equals nil, right? It kind of looks like maybe I could do that. But here I'm going to get an error saying expected a type, but list has kind star arrow star. So this is, if you look at it, very similar to this error that we saw just a minute ago about not. Um, in that here, I want to say, well, what is the type of y? Well, I say it's a list, but that's actually not enough information, right? Because a list here, it depends on, or, or the type really depends on what the element type is, right? The, a con cell, when we're building onto a list, it's storing something of type A. And so that means that this list here isn't a type. It's a type constructor, or we could also say it has kind type arrow type. So this star symbol down here is just a, a, essentially an abbreviation for um, a built-in thing in, in Haskell called type. So what I can do here is I can say import data.kind, and just to be explicit, this gives us type. And then now, just like I could give a type signature to not, I can say that it has type bool arrow bool, I can give a kind signature to list. So I can write type list is type arrow type. So this is built into Haskell 98. This is a new idea. So if I try to compile, I'm going to get a complaint that I need to enable st standalone kind signatures. So let's do that. Um, oh, okay. And now, now we're back to the error down here, right? Because list, I said, is not a type. Just like not needs a bool to become a bool, list needs a type to become a type. Um, and so that means that this uh, declaration down here is wrong. It has to be something like list bool, and then everything is okay again. Um, okay, so again, this idea is that I can I can describe a type just like I describe normal uh, a, a normal function, right? List is only a type when given another type. We can keep going with this. I can define an either type. Um, so let's hide either um, because I want to redefine it here. So I can say data either a b is left a or right b. That's so far so good. But now, either here takes two arguments, 
right? It takes an A and a B. So I can actually ask in GHCI, what is its kind by doing colon kind, just like I would normally say colon type. So I can ask, what is the kind of either? And GHC tells me it's star arrow star arrow star, which again, I'm gonna write using this, this longhand type here instead of, instead of using star. Star is sort of the older style, um, uh, and as, at some point we're gonna get rid of that notation from GHC um, and just use this type. It turns out that this star is very hard to parse because it kind of looks like an infix operator. Um, one thing that I definitely wanna say at this point is this star is not some kind of wild card, right? It's a really easy mistake. Uh, maybe I just say that because I made this mistake when I was first learning it, that, uh, that this star means, oh, it can be any old type. That's not the case. It's just, it's a very specific kind and it's the kind of normal types. Um, so I'll see, we'll see an example of that in just a moment. So I can ask what the kind of either is, and that means that if I want to, I can write a standalone kind signature for either that looks just like this, right? I have either goes from type to type to type, and we're happy with that. Um, okay, so the fact that either has this type means that down here in my list example, I can't say list either. Right? I can't just pass anything to list. I need to pass something of kind type. So if I try this, I'm going to get an error, expecting two more arguments to either. Really, it's the second line. This, this first line is a guess. Uh, the second line is a little bit more accurate in that it's expecting a type. In other words, something of kind type. But actually, either has kind type, arrow type, arrow type. And so this application here is ill-kinded, just as if I said not of x. Right? If, I, if I write down here not of x, I have bool doesn't match car. Well, here, list either, either doesn't match the kind that list expects. Um, and so that's what's going on here. Um, it's worth saying that all types have this. So if I make data booley equals truey or falsey, um, that's, oh, now I still have a problem down here. I can say list booley, and that should work. Um, and this bool also has a kind. I can write kind booley and it's just plain old type, right? This is the same for the, the built-in type like int. And of course, I can write a kind signature by writing type bully colon colon type if I wanna be really explicit about it. Um, so why is this useful? Why does Haskell have this feature of being able to talk about kinds? There's lots of other languages that don't have this power. Um, and, and the reason is, is that we want to be able to abstract over kinds. So let me write another, uh, or abstract over, not over kinds, abstract over things that have kind other than type. I'll unpack that in just a moment. Um, so let's say instead of just list here, let's also have a tree. So maybe it's not equal, uh, not bar there. I need a tree is either a leaf or it's, an, it's a node that stores a tree on the left, some data, and then a tree on the right. Um, okay, so that's all well and good. Now, at this point, we should see what the kind of tree is. Again, it's one of these things that needs a type to create a type. So if I ask its kind here, we're gonna see it's star arrow star. So I say I can say type tree, it's type arrow type. And now what I can do with both list and tree is say that these are both, these both have instances of functor. So I can do that just by writing deriving functor here. Oh, and it's gonna complain about needing a, a derive functor extension. Okay, so what is this functor? Well, I'm not gonna write it out here, but it, we have a class functor f where fmap, whoops, takes a to b to fa to fb. All right, that's the definition of functor. And here I can see that this class parameter f it's not used as the result of an arrow, as the argument to an arrow. It's used here in sort of a function position in that f takes some argument a. Well, what is a? a is a, is a type. In other words, it has kind type. And here, f produces something of kind type. So we can say that f here has kind type arrow type. And so here, when I say deriving functor, that's kind of like saying instance functor whoops, I can't spell tonight, uh, instance functor list where and then stuff. And then down here, this is like saying instance functor tree and then stuff. Um, 
And so this functor allows me to say, well, this list thing and this tree thing have something in common. They're both structures that hold information, that hold this A. And because both of them derive functor, it allows me to write functions that work over both lists and trees, like fmap, right? fmap will work over both lists and trees, so that's really nice. It's only through this notion of, of saying that list and tree have the same kind that I can do it, right? Um, so if I try to write instance functor int, where, I can even leave that out, right? Here, I'm gonna get an error, expected kind type arrow type, but int has kind type. And that's because when I write functor, the thing after the word functor should have kind type arrow type. But actually, that's usually expressed, that idea of what a function expects, that's expressed in its kind. And the same is true for functor. So here, I could write a standalone kind signature for functor, and that functor takes a type arrow type thing, and what does it produce? It produces a constraint. Um, so there are other things that are like this. So monad is another thing like this. So let's write out monad. So class, I'll, let me hide monad from the prelude first. Um, so if I say class monad, well, monad takes an M, and then the most important aspect of monad is that it has this bind operator, which looks like this. And so here, just like we saw with fmap, this M is applied to something else. So this M has to have kind type arrow type. Um, so here I can give a standalone kind signature to my monad class, which is type arrow type arrow constraint. So I'm using constraint here without importing it, which is very silly of me. Um, but then I haven't said what it is. So constraint is something that can appear to the left of a fat arrow. Um, so maybe I want to write, um, oh, um, uh, not very important here. So I can write m monad m arrow m a to m a, where my id just returns the thing. So this is a bit silly. But my point here is that monad m, if m has the right kind, then monad m is going to have kind constraint, which makes it suitable as something on the on the left-hand side of a fat arrow, right? So, so this kind system is really quite rich. There's a lot that we can do with it. Um, just as, as, a, as a showing of where we might go from here is we can actually build these things called monad transformers. So if we take an existing monad and want to build something on top of it, we can, and now the types get even more involved. Um, so let's go down here. And if I want to write the reader T monad transformer, this is actually uh, uh, something that's readily available, but I'll, I'll just define it here. So data reader T, well, a reader T, it means it's, we're going to take some existing monad M, and then we're going to take some environment, I'll call it E here, um, and then there's going to be some resulting type A. And so a reader T is just a function. Um, actually, this is going to be a new type, isn't it? Um, and it's going to be a function that takes an E and returns an MA. Um, so the exact details here, I'm not going to get into, but the idea, but so the notion here is that what I, what I want is I want the, the payload to be a, a function that carries around this environment and then returns some action in the underlying monad M. So let's see my, my reader T, let's see what its kind is. So I can check that out and we're going to get this monster. And so indeed we can type that in as a standalone kind signature. So let's do that. So we have reader T is type to type arrow type to type to type. Now, let's see how this, how this lines up, right? This first type here, well, that's the kind of this environment E, right? When we carry that around, that's gonna be some real type. Maybe it just remembers an int or maybe it remembers some large structure, but it's gonna be a proper type. But then this M, that's some underlying monad that we're wrapping. Right? We can see here, we use M and we apply it to something else. So it has to be a function type. Uh, or rather have a function kind. Um, and so here we're gonna get type arrow type. Um, and then the final result here, A, well that's type, and then this whole thing is a type, so we have this. So this is this reader T monad transformer. The last example that we're gonna look at is for uh, the monad trans class. So let's look at monad trans here. 
which allows us to take some computation in a monad and then lift it into a monad transformer. Um, so uh, my, my reader T is actually an instance of this monad trans class. Um, I could sort of explore how to do that. That's not really the point here, but we could make one for reader T. Um, but now what I want to figure out is what is the kind of monad trans? Um, so let's do the analysis. Instead of just asking GHA, let's see if we can figure this out. So clearly monad trans takes one argument and it's a class constraint. So I can write this piece. Now this argument T, well, how is it used? Well, T takes two arguments and then results in a type. I know it results in a type because it's used on either side of an arrow here. Um, so that means it's gonna look like something like this. And then now, well, what are the arguments to T? Uh, well, the first one is a monad, so it's going to have a monad kind, which looks like this, and then the other is the result. So here I have another type. Now, does that work? It does. Um, and, and so here, now we can see that this ability to abstract over kinds and write them down, it means that we can build big complex things like monad trans, where we can gather up things like reader T and writer T and maybe T that all have this same pattern and abstract over them. And this lift function can now work over a variety of different monad transformers. Um, in a language like Java, Java has parameterized types, right? Array list takes some type. We don't say array list, we say array list integer. Um, but we can't go that one level further. We can't sort of have some something that abstracts over both array list and linked list um, and uh, set, right? These are all things in Java that take an argument, uh, but we can't abstract over that class of things because Java doesn't have this notion of kinds. In Haskell, we do have that, and that allows us to build up better abstractions. Um, next week, we're going to return to kinds, but talk more about more modern kinds that aren't just built up from types and arrows, but do some other interesting things as well. I hope this has been interesting. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.